This presentation focuses on A-levels and how useful A-level subjects are to gain access to higher education. I will start with a little bit of background. Previous research shows that the student and the school characteristics, for example, gender, prior attainment, social background, type of a school, are important factors affecting higher education participation and the type of higher education institution attended. However, over the past few years, Policymakers and the general public in England have become increasingly concerned about the extent to which different qualifications and subjects prepare young people for careers or further study. In fact, multiple studies have shown that the progression of young people differs depending on the qualifications and subjects studied even after taking into account their background characteristics. In England, the principal measure of academic attainment for 18-year-old pre-university students is the A-level. In recent years, over 80 different subjects have been offered at A-level. Students can decide which and how many of those subjects they wish to study, depending on, for example, their career aspirations, their academic ability, the provision of their school, or the advice given to them. The students aiming for university typically study three or four subjects at A-level. Choosing A-levels, however, is not as straightforward, and there are several reasons for it. For example, some subjects might be seen as providing better grounding for university courses than others. Many higher education courses require particular subjects, and admissions staff view some A-levels more favorably than others. The main aim of this research was to provide a better understanding of how useful A-level subjects are for gaining admission to higher education. In particular, it investigated the proportion of students who hold different A-level subjects or combinations of A-level subjects when applying for a place at a higher education institution. The performance in different A-levels amongst the students applying for a place at a higher education institution and how students' background, in particular their gender and the type of the school attended, interacts with the choice of A-level subjects to influence the type of higher education institution attended. Before presenting the results, just a little bit of information about the students included in the research. So the study follow a cohort of 18 year olds in English schools and colleges through the first year of their higher education studies. These students achieve at least one A level, graded A star to E, during case stage five. We use data from two sources. The National People Database, which has information on A level qualifications and attainment, prior attainment, that is the GCSE and other qualifications taken at Key Stage 4, and also information about the students' characteristics, such as gender, type of the school attending, and deprivation. We also use data from the Higher Education Statistics Agency. The data from HISA cover all full-time first-year undergrads and was linked to the MPD. In particular, the HISA data included the subject of the Higher Education course and the Higher Education institution. The size of the A-level cohort in this research was just over 275,000. Approximately 160,000 students appear in the HISA student records. The A-level students who were not in the HISA data, that's about 40% of the A-level cohort, might not have applied to study in a higher education institution. They might not have been offered a place in a higher education institution, or they might have taken a gap year. It is also worth noting that the linkage between MPD and HISA is done by name, date of birth and postcode, so some A-level students may have been lost in the matching process. For the analysis in this research, different combinations of A-level subjects were used. In particular, I look at the most popular combinations of A-levels, and I classify the A-levels using content-based groups, in particular applied, expressive, humanities, languages, and STEM. I also use different classification of the higher education institutions, in particular, Institutions were considered into groups, Russell Group and other. Institutions were also classified as being or not in the Saturn Trust top 30 most selective universities, with some analysis focusing on Oxford and Cambridge specifically. And institutions were also classified by their ranking. For that, I used the Complete University Guide. In this research, the overall ranking and the ranking by student satisfaction, research quality and graduation prospects were considered to group higher education institutions. Each of the measures was used to divide institutions into three approximately equally sized groups, low, medium, or high ranking. Together with descriptive statistics, 
which show the popularity of A-level subjects and combinations of A-level subjects in relation to higher education participation, multi-level logistic regressions were used to study the likelihood of students with different A-level subjects or specialisms, that's two or more A-levels in a subject area, to study in a specific higher education institutions once their characteristics had been accounted for. The following tables and graphs are just a very small selection of what is available in the report from this research. The report is published in the Cambridge Assessment website. First of all, this table shows the uptake of individual A-level subjects for students starting higher education courses in the 2016-17 academic year, and it compares that with the uptake of these subjects by the national A-level cohort. Only the subjects taken by at least 1% of the cohort are included in the table. The table is sorted by the percentage of students with the subject enrolled in higher education, so by the last column in the table. The table shows, for example, that over 71% of the students with an A-level in further maths enroll in higher education, and that around 65% of those with A-levels in science subjects, for example, chemistry, physics, or biology, and in mathematics, started a higher education course following completion of Key Stage 5. On the other hand, if you look at the bottom of the table, you can see that fewer than 50% of the students with A-levels in art and design or in film studies enrolled in higher education. We can also see that mathematics, highlighted in green, which was the most popular A-level subject overall in 2016 and taken by 27.4% of the cohort, was taken by 31% of university students, but only by 23% of non-university students. The most popular subjects amongst university students following maths were psychology, biology, history, chemistry and English literature, although not in that order. If we break down the uptake by higher education institutions, we see, for example, that mathematics was taken by 48.2% of the students in Russell Group Universities, 67.4% of the students in the Universities of Cambridge or Oxford, and 47.5% of the students in universities included in the Sutton Trust Top 30 group. The figures for the Russell Group and the Sutton Trust are very similar for most subjects, probably because there are many institutions in common in these two groups. This table shows that the students in Cambridge and Oxford universities held in higher proportions A-levels in other STEM subjects, for example, chemistry, physics, or further maths, and in foreign languages, French, German, or Spanish, than students in other universities. Just very briefly, some results by degree subject area. So this table only shows seven subject areas, but data for all 19 subject areas is available in the report. So, mathematics was taken by 99.5% of the candidates accepted to pursue a degree in mathematical sciences. It was taken as well by 22% of the candidates accepted to biological sciences degrees and by 10% of the candidates accepted to study languages. On the other hand, business studies was taken by only 38.5% of the students accepted to study a degree in business and administrative studies. So, the link between the A-level subject and the degree subject area is not as strong for business as it was for maths. French and Spanish were taken only by 14.1% and 11.1% respectively of the students enrolling in a language degree. Note that the languages degrees area includes courses among others in linguistics, literature, English, American studies, Celtic languages, literature and, lit and culture, Latin. So it's possible that a student enrolling in a language degree with a 1A level in an MFL subject. I am going to move now from the uptake of individual A-level subjects to the uptake of combinations of A-level subjects. As I mentioned earlier, using the A-level taxonomy based on subject content, A-levels were classified as applied, expressive, humanities, languages and STEM. The students were then assigned to an A-level specialism. If they had two or more A-levels in one area, they were a specialist in that area. If they had four A-levels, two in each area, we consider them to have multiple specialisms and if they had A-levels in multiple areas, they had no specialism. So this graph shows the types of students in each type of higher education institution. For example, over half of the students in Oxford and Cambridge were specialists in STEM, that's the dark blue bars. This contrasts with only 14% or 19% in low or medium rank higher education institutions. The percentage of the students with multiple specialisms, and that's in light blue, 
was also higher at Oxford and Cambridge than at other universities. Just over 30% of the students in low rank universities did not have an A level in specialism, and that's in green. The percentage of the specialists in humanities, in grey, decreased with the increase in ranking of the higher education institutions. On the contrary, the percentages of a specialist in STEM and language subjects increase with the increase in ranking of the higher education institutions. The schools and colleges offer a wide range of A-levels, and in theory, many subject combinations are possible. In this research, there were almost 18,000 different combinations of at least three A-level subjects. The most common combinations involve science subjects, for example, biology, chemistry and maths, was by far the most popular combination, although it was only taken by 5% of the A-level cohort. The most common combination consisted of humanities subjects, was English literature, history and psychology, and that was in seventh position. Before moving on to performance, I wanted to point out that the patterns of A-level uptake might be influenced by the type of degrees and entry requirements offered at the different types of higher education institutions. For example, candidates with A-levels in less academic or applied subjects could be more attracted to the latter types of degrees and therefore the university choices could be determined by their degree choices. Just a couple of slides about A-level performance. I'm going to focus on the students who achieve the AAB threshold, although I also look at other measures and you can see the results for that in the report of the research. So approximately a quarter of university students achieve AAB or above. However, there is wide variation in this measure across university groups. For example, half of the Russell group of students formed AAB or above. Almost all the students at Oxbridge attain AAB or above. But only 3% of the students in universities with an overall ranking of medium do so. If we look at the breakdowns by degree subject area, we see that over 90% of the students enroll in a medicine and dentistry degree, and almost 80% of those in veterinary science achieve A, A, B or above. Mm -hmm. Both these degree subject areas are particularly competitive, so it is not surprising that the A-level attainment of the students pursuing them was very high. The students doing degrees in mathematical or physical sciences and degrees in languages also had high A-level attainment. The students with the lowest A-level attainment were enrolled generally in degrees in the areas of mass communications and documentation, computer science, creative arts and design, and education. This last part of the presentation looks at factors that affect enrollment in higher education. In particular, I was interested in how a student's background characteristics, for example, gender, prior attainment, previous institution type, interact with the subjects taken at A-level to influence participation in higher education and the type of higher education institution attended. To investigate this, I carried out some multi-level logistic regression analysis. There are details of the models in the report. Today, I'm just going to very briefly mention some of the findings. First of all, the effect of A-level specialism on the probability of enrolling in higher education. The first graph here shows that the students specializing in stressic subjects were less likely to enroll in higher education than the students with any other specialism. And a specialist in humanities at A-level had the highest probabilities of attending higher education, followed by STEM specialists. Also, looking at the second graph by higher education institution, the students specialized on expressive subjects were less likely to attend an institution in the Russell group than any other students, including those without any specialism. But the specialists in languages at A level had the highest probabilities of attending institutions in the Russell and Sutton Trust top 30 groups, or institutions with a high overall ranking, followed by humanities specialists. The effect of A level specialism was a bit different for students enrolling at Oxford and Cambridge. For example, the students with no specialism were more likely to enroll in Oxford or Cambridge than the students specializing in STEM subjects and the students specializing in languages and humanities were the most likely to enroll at Oxford or Cambridge. Remember that we are taking into account the students' characteristics like the gender attainment at key stage 4, the attainment at A level, the school type and deprivation when looking at the effect of their specialism. Other factors that affect enrollment in higher education um, are discussed now. In terms of gender, male students 
were significantly less likely than female students with the same prior attainment and same background characteristics to enroll in higher education. However, if they enrolled at all, male students were significantly more likely than female students to attend institutions in the Russell Group, institutions at the Sutton Trust of 30, Oxford and Cambridge, and institutions with a high overall ranking. The probability of attending any higher education institution increased significantly with the number of A-levels achieved after controlling for a series of other factors, as mentioned earlier. Furthermore, overall achievement at A-level was a significant predictor of enrollment in a higher education institution. The higher the A-level score, the higher the probability of enrollment, suggesting that A-levels are good preparation for university. Although all else be equal, students in independent schools were less likely to enroll higher education immediately after completing the A-levels, the probability of attending prestigious or high-ranking institutions was higher for them compared to similar students in the state-maintained schools. This is important from a widening participation point of view, as it provides evidence that young people from a state rather than independent schools continue to be underrepresented at higher status university. However, in contrast, there was not an effect of a school type, independent versus state, on the probability of attending Oxford or Cambridge. To investigate whether gender and type of a school interact with A-level specialism to influence enrollment in higher education, I carried out some progression analysis where I considered interactions between these two student characteristics and the A-level specialism. This analysis show, for example, that male students specializing in STEM and expressive subjects were more likely than female students specializing in the same areas to enroll in higher education. On the contrary, female students were more likely to enroll in higher education than male students if they were a specialist in applied humanities or language A-level subjects. Female students were also more likely to enroll in higher education if they had multiple specialisms. These patterns were fairly similar for the likelihood of enrolling in different types of higher education institutions. Regarding type of a school, the STEM specialists, for example, were more likely to attend Russell Group or Saturn Trust top 30 institutions if they took their A-levels in an independent school than if they did so in a state school. However, for these students, the probability of attending Oxford or Cambridge did not vary by the type of a school they attended. There is a lot more detail about these interactions in the report. A couple of final comments now. The process of application and admission to universities in the UK places a relatively strong weight on the type of subjects achieved by students. As a result, choice is a key factor influencing progression from secondary education to higher education. This research aimed to provide quantitative evidence to show how different A-level subjects and combinations of subjects are used by students to access higher education and in particular different types of higher education institutions. Although careful choice of available subjects and specialisms is crucial for enrolling in higher education and in particular for enrolling in specific institutions, background characteristics like gender, school type, are still part of the explanation for differential participation in higher education in the UK. And just a very final thought, while the access gap between students from different backgrounds has narrowed in recent years due to widening participation activities, the gap between the most selective institutions seems to remain. Contextualizing admissions, for example, taking into account candidates' backgrounds when making decisions, might be one way to make progress towards narrowing this gap. That's everything from me. Thank you very much. Thank you.